Hello. Today we're considering one of Philip Larkin's greatest poems, 1914. Before we start, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it'd be greatly appreciated if you would. Thank you so much. I have the poem here, so let's start. Those long, uneven lines, standing as patiently as if they were stretched outside the oval or villa park, the crowns of hats, the sun, on moustached archaic faces, grinning as if it were all an August bank holiday lark. And the shut shops, the bleached established names on the sun blinds, the farthings and the sovereigns, and dark clothed children at play, called after kings and queens, the tin advertisements for Coco and Twist, and the pubs wide open all day. And the countryside not caring, the place names all hazed over with flowering grasses and fields, shadowing doomsday lines under wheat's restless silence. The differently dressed servants with tiny rooms in huge houses, the dust behind limousines. Never such innocence never before or since, as changed itself to past without a word. The men leaving the gardens tidy, the thousands of marriages lasting a little while longer, never such innocence again. 1914 is a moving and poignant poem with plenty to unpack, so Let's start. Larkin chooses to title his poem in Roman numerals rather than familiar Arabic numbers because Roman numerals remind us of the Roman Empire, another empire that declined and fell. Using Roman numerals formalises the poem and fits the theme of commemoration and mourning as these numerals are found often on war memorials. Larkin was inspired to write the poem on seeing images of civilians queuing outside recruiting offices. In Britain and the rest of Europe, the war was greeted with enthusiasm, heady excitement, and men turned up in droves to enlist. They saw enlisting as a chance to escape the dull routine of work of limited opportunities and join an adventure for the short time it lasted. Of course, at the time, they had no idea how long the war would last, that it would last for four years and bring with it unimaginable horrors. The Britain that emerged in its aftermath had changed radically and would never be the same. It marked the start of Britain's decline a nation psychologically scarred and bankrupt. It lost its pre-war swagger, its confidence, and within 50 years, accelerated by the Second World War, it would lose its empire. The poem begins with the speaker describing the men queuing outside the recruiting office to enlist those long, uneven lines. Long lines remind us of the excitement that greeted the war as men turned up at recruitment stations to enlist. In such large numbers that many were told to go home and return the following day or week. Long and uneven lines provide foreshadowing to remind us of the expansive trench networks, a prominent feature of the war in Western Europe. Standing as patiently as if they were stretched outside the oval or Villa Park. Lines two to four position the poem in England. Line two reminds us of the British characteristic of queuing patiently. 
Line three makes cultural references to the Oval, a cricket ground, and Villa Park, a football stadium, emblematic representing the country's two national sports. The queuing men look like they are about to attend a sporting event at the Oval or Villa Park. Alluding to sport suggests the crowd's excitement as they anticipate taking part in a great event. Villa Park rhymes with Lark in line 8. Lark is something light-hearted and playful we do on holidays. Indeed, on lines 7 and 8, Larkin mentions August bank holiday, traditionally a day spent relaxing, having fun, picnicking or at the seaside. Historically, Britain entered the war on the 4th of August 1914, the August bank holiday. These references suggest the men see the war as a great adventure they do not want to miss. Grinning reminds us the men are happy and excited at the prospect of fighting in a war. But grinning connotes, suggests, the grinning skull, foreshadowing death in the carnage that is to come. On lines 5 and 6, reference to the crowns of hats, the sun on moustached archaic faces, reminds us of how quaint and old, archaic, the photograph seems to the speaker. It speaks of another time when almost all men wore a hat of every description and sported long moustaches. However, crowns on line 5 reminds us of the faces of the kings and emperors who sent their countries to war. Stanzas 2 and 3 describe a world about to end. Stanza 2 focuses on the urban city world. Stanza 3 focuses on the rural countryside. In stanza 2 lines 9 and 10 and the shut shops, the bleached established names on the sun blinds. Here the speaker describes how the image has faded with time bleached established names on sun blinds. Many shops of the period were named after their owners. Again, this foreshadows the men who will be bleached, erased from life. Shut shops refers to storekeepers locking their shops, either because it is a bank holiday or possibly to enlist but it possibly also alludes to the tradition of commemoration after the war on Armistice Day when shops closed in respect of the dead. So as we can see, early in the poem and throughout, Larkin employs foreshadowing to suggest the terrible events about to happen. From line 11 onwards, the poet presents images emblematic, representing the period. For example, the currency that seems so foreign to us now, farthings and sovereigns. Here sovereigns is a pun, similar to crowns on line 5. It reminds us that after the war, all across Europe, the Russian, Austro-Hungarian and German empires fell and dynasties tumbled, their sovereigns murdered or forced to abdicate, surrender their power. Line 12, with its reference to dark clothed children at play, are a reminder of the reserved way children dressed in Edwardian and Georgian times. It also suggests the dark of mourning, a reminder that many of these children will lose their fathers in the war, or soon be of age to enlist or conscripted into the armed services and possibly die. Line 13 recalls how patriotic people were back then and the quaint tradition of parents naming their children after famous kings and queens, Victoria, Edward, George and William. During the war, the men fought for king and country. 
When Larkin wrote this poem in the 1960s, people were less patriotic. By the end of the war, even the royal family had changed, replacing its Germanic name, Saxe Coburg Gotha, to something English sounding, Windsor. In lines 14 to 16, the tin advertisements for Coco and Twist and the pubs wide open all day. Larkin mentions products we recognise, Coco, Tobacco, Twist, and that British institution, the pub, to show the world of 1914 was in some ways similar to now. The tin advertisements remind us of the gifts sent to the soldiers in the trenches at Christmas 1914 that Princess Mary, the King's daughter, helped organise. However, lines 15 and 16 hint at the changes soon to arrive. Pubs wide open all day soon became regulated with restrictive opening and closing times. Regulation continues to the present day. Perhaps Larkin is suggesting that the Britain before 1914 was a world with less restriction and regulation. Stanza 3 marks a departure from the first two stanzas because the speaker is no longer describing the images he sees in the photograph. The photograph has provided a springboard for him to contemplate much wider themes. Larkin employs this approach often in his poems, describing a specific detail he observes and then broadening the poem and introducing themes that detail has prompted. In this case, observing the photograph leads him to reflect on British society in 1914 and draw comparisons with the present, for Larkin, 1960s Britain. Stanza 3 describes the calm before the storm. The poet juxtaposes his focus on rural country life with the urban city scene he described in stanzas 1 and 2 to show how the war would affect every aspect of British life. Line 17 and the countryside not caring employs a binary opposite to the city people who line up eager to join the war. Not caring reminds us that country people have other priorities, tilling the land, growing crops and raising livestock. However, the farmers and their labourers will soon be caught up in the war's fever and later conscripted into the war. This reference to countryside not caring reminds us that the war on that day seems far removed from them. Larkin presents a scene of tranquility, an unhurried, slow-paced existence where flowers are left to grow across the place names of ancient villages named in the Doomsday Book. Assonance, using words with elongated vowel sounds, slow the poem's pace, creating a sense of calm, hazed over flowering grasses and fields. Line 20, shadowing doomsday lines. Here, doomsday references the great 1086 survey William I conducted of the English lands he had conquered in 1066. Larkin suggests that in the countryside is nearly 1,000 years of unaltered English history and social structure, all of which is about to be undermined and destroyed by the First World War. Shadowing and Doomsday foreshadows the catastrophe to come and with it the doom of the British Empire. Line here reminds us of the poem's opening line and that a lineage, something that has continued for centuries, is soon to be broken. So those of you familiar with Downton Abbey and similar TV programmes will have an understanding, a grounding in how that class system operated. Line 22 
differently dressed servants remind us of the prevalence class system before the First World War, the hierarchy of master and servant, and servant and servant, with each allocated a station in life and dressed differently, accordingly. The earlier reference to the Doomsday Book suggests that in many respects the social structure of the English countryside was feudal and little had changed from the time of Norman and Saxon. On line 23, with tiny rooms in huge houses, reflects the disparity between the rich and the poor, with the servants living in squat, cramped rooms within huge mansions. On line 24, reference to limousines reminds us of the ostentatious, showy material wealth of the time. But reference to dust behind them reminds us that soon the servants would be called up to fight and the chauffeurs would not be there to keep all clean and tidy. Dust also, using foreshadowing, reminds us that the world of 1914 is soon to turn to dust and be swept away. Stanza 3 employs more foreshadowing. Flowering grasses remind us of the battlefield after the war and how nature reasserted itself quickly. Grasses flowered once more and birdsong was heard moments after the guns fell silent. On line 21, under wheat's restless silence, creates an image of the serried ranks, the rows of soldiers, restless, silence through death, but restless to be remembered and tell their story. This is an important theme that Larkin explores further in stanza 4, line 28. In stanza 4, Larkin pulls together the themes he has explored in this poem. Using anaphora, where the same word is repeated at the start of more than one line, here on lines 25 and 26, never such innocence, never before or since, and on the final line, never such innocence again, elevates the poem. This rhetorical device transforms the poem into a eulogy, a speech praising someone who has died, a speech commonly heard at funeral services. But in this poem, who is this eulogy for? Larkin uses the poem to commemorate the men who died without the opportunity to share their stories and experiences, the literal and metaphoric silent dead. The dead Larkin's metaphor alludes to on line 21, the wheat's restless silence. Those restless to be heard but left without a word. Lines 28 and 29 expand this theme. Without a word, the men leaving the gardens tidy. Line 29, leaving the gardens tidy, reminds us of the prim respectability of the men that went to war. Neat gardens contrast with our knowledge of the war of Flanders fields, churned up battlefields, the grave of many. Larkin uses irony. The men expect to return to their gardens, but through hindsight we know what they do not know, that few of them will return. Larkin writes for the silent, those who never left an account of their lives. In contrast, we have the accounts of Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Rupert Brooke and many others. There is perhaps a class issue here too. Many war poets and writers came from privileged backgrounds, upper middle class, upper class backgrounds. Many were grammar school, public school and Oxbridge educated. Larkin perhaps attempts to redress the balance, to commemorate remember the ordinary men the photograph captures and erect a monument in 
poem form for them. Larkin seeks to remind us of the ordinary men, of their optimism, innocence and perhaps naivety that carried them to war that fateful bank holiday of 1914. Larkin continues to share small, well-observed details to lend further poignancy. On line 30, he refers to the thousands of marriages lasting a little while longer, and we realise that soon wives will be widows. Also, Larkin likely eulogises, commemorates the pre-war period, a time he believes was the high point of British society. The final stanza creates a dignified tone befitting a eulogy, a poem of commemoration. This stanza and the preceding ones create a nostalgic, melancholic mood. Larkin's focus on larger themes makes the poem contemplative as he reflects on the significance of 1914 for the British. Enjambment, run-on lines, create the sense of someone delivering a speech. For example, on lines 26 to 28, never before or since has changed itself to past without a word. Larkin's poems generally document the social changes he experienced in the 1950s and 1960s, notably sexual freedom and women's rights. Here, Larkin is retrospective, looking backwards, pinpointing the reason for the changes he felt decades later. The poem reminds us that societies can change relatively quickly and events have unforeseen consequences. The poem commemorates the dead of the war, but also the death of an era, a way of life, an attitude. Great Britain would decline and never be again the power it once was. Let's consider how Larkin uses structure to complement, match his themes. Larkin's line endings take on a curious pattern. 14 of the 32 lines end on a plural, including men in the final stanza, suggesting the widespread change. The poem is organised into four eight-line stanzas, with rhymes on the fourth and eighth lines of each stanza. The lack of a uniform rhyme scheme amid a well-structured poem hints at the chaos to come. The poem was completed in May 1960 and forms part of Larkin's 1964 poetry collection, The Whitson Weddings. Interestingly, the poem provides a retrospective view of the First World War rather than the contemporary views of poets and writers who served in it. The poem offers a different perspective and places the war in terms of a larger historical picture, which charts the decline of British society. Written in the third person voice creates a sense of detachment. The final line is ambiguous. It can be interpreted that we should mourn that the British lost their innocence, but it could also mean that the British would never be naive and follow their government and leaders blindly into war again. Subsequent events support this view. The growth of a pacifist movement in the interwar years and a general reluctance by politicians and the public to mobilise against Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Larkin may be using innocence ironically and warning us to beware of wallowing in nostalgia, believing Britain enjoyed a golden period before the war. Perhaps it was for some, but not for many. Like all great poets, Larkin allows us to interpret the poem on our own terms and relevant to our present. A poem that invites rereading and revisiting. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. If so, please hit the like button below. Also check out our other videos on textual analysis and writing, including videos on other Philip Larkin poems. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Thank you so much. Until next time, from Carol and me, write well.